live from Austin, Texas. It's the Cube, covering Dell EMC World 2016. Brought to you by Dell EMC. Now here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Dell EMC World at Austin, Texas, 2016. This is the Cube, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. Dale Skivington is here. She's the Chief Privacy Officer at Dell, and she's joined by Nick Kukuru, uh, who's the Vice President of Big Data Practice at Mastercard, folks. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Very important topic, uh, privacy, security, I like to talk to them as two sides of the same coin, but Dale, why don't you start it off, tell us what you guys are talking about here at Dell EMC World. Thanks, well um, oftentimes you're right, privacy and security are two really different uh, topics to talk about and Nick will cover a lot this afternoon about the importance of securing data in order to have a successful big data program. But privacy is also of a concern to our shareholders and stakeholders, and that is privacy deals with what information do you collect, what information, how do you use that information, and who, to whom do you, with whom do you share it? And that's a little different than securing the data. And our regulators and our customers are getting increasingly concerned about those issues, and so it requires some governance and some thought to be put into those programs, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And it's interesting, Nick, because in 2006, when the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure enabled uh, 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 or, or required organizations to retain and produce electronic material, it instantly became the notion that data was a liability. And everybody wanted to understand, okay, when can I delete it? When can I get rid of it? And then, when this big data meme occurred, all of a sudden data becomes an asset in a big way. Even though it's always been an asset, and we know that, but in a bigger way, it was almost like a bit flip, and it sort of changed the attitudes. Is that a reasonable description, and how did that affect how you approached privacy? Well, part of it is, is you're absolutely right. It became an, an asset. Everyone started, wanted to monetize the data that they were carrying because there were great nuggets that sat inside that data. So when we started talking about security, you know, originally you talk about personally identifiable information, right? And that's what everyone's at name, address, phone numbers, you know, even email addresses. But then it started to turn into, as we started to bring other sources of data, such as Facebook, Twitter, all that data that sits out there in social media together, we started to realize other pieces of information needed to be secure as well. So now you've broadened the way that you want to take a look at security because all this unstructured data starts to come in where you can identify people through a picture, a photograph, through a Twitter feed. And what you want to be able to say is how do I protect them as much as I protect someone's credit card or someone's personally identifiable name, address, and phone number. Hey Dale, what, talk about your role at, at, at Dell. It's interesting to have a chief privacy officer on at Dell and now of course Dell EMC. <laughs> opens up a whole new can of worms, if I can say that. Yes, so together with our Chief Information Security Officer, who looks uh, at the policies and procedures around securing data, my team is responsible for the policies, procedures, and controls relating to the use of the data. So, you know, in terms of, the reason why our session today is called the ethical use of data is because the laws are lagging a little bit in terms of requiring certain things to be put in place about the use. They're starting to develop, but what each regulator has said in the US and Europe and elsewhere is they've given companies and technology companies a chance to put in good governance in place. And they've asked the companies to put in internal review boards and, and accountable, uh, responsible individuals in those organizations to make good decisions about the use of data. And that's what a chief privacy officer helps the organization do develop the governance structure and help with the accountability of the use of, and the decisions around using data. So there's obviously a big discussion going on like this inside of MasterCard, and Nick, you were talking about everybody wants to monetize the data or figure out how data can help them monetize. So how do you deal with that? You know, analytics, and, and you know, you guys talk about the creepy factor. I, I always worry that Amazon knows more about me than I do. <laughs> they know <laughs> when I'm out of something and I'm reordering and my patterns, and, and that's kind of creepy. So how do you deal with that? You know, part of what we do on my side of the house is we anonymize the data in many cases for that type of analysis. So we try to take that personally identifiable information out of the analysis. So again, I can, we call it anonymization, 
where we actually on the front end say, I don't care who you are, what I care about is your, are your patterns, and can I figure out what those patterns are to create affinities. So by taking them out of the front end and anonymizing the data, doing the analysis on it, and then potentially at the back end, our customers re-identifying those people that we have anonymized on the front end, that makes it a little bit better because it's no longer a creepy factor per se, because when you work with someone like Dale on what the usage of that data is, in many cases, when you do that analysis, it's doing it for the good of that person. So that person either A, gets a healthier lifestyle, B, um, gets to see the products and services that they want to see, or want to be able to you know, purchase or whatever. So again, for us, it's been able to understand how we protect the individual as you look through the entire analysis stream. And that's what we do on the advisor side with our customers. So that's cool, but the chief marketing officer, he or she, <laughs> wants to identify that individual, you know, the, the customer of one, you know, that one-to-one -one personal interaction. How do you square that circle? Well, that's actually, when we work with the marketing team, they always say that, well, we have a population of five million in our database, and I want to look at all five million. It's like, yes, you can. Look at all five million, but let's anonymize them, because most cases, you're going to send them to your data scientists, and there's 20 or 30 data scientists that could be working on these five million to create your campaigns. They don't need to know names, phone numbers, or addresses, so secure the data, so that you're not carrying identifiable information through the ecosystem. Only at the very end, when you say, out of that population of five million, Mr. Marketer, here's the half a million that have a high propensity to do what you're asking them to do, is when you re-identify it. So at that particular point, you haven't put five million people at risk, you've actually put half a million people what you want them to do, which is the propensity to purchase or the propensity to take an action. So again, at the end is when you re-identify and say these are the number of, these are the people we should be sending a, a mail or two, or an email to, or so, an offer. And that narrows the threat Correct. matrix, if I could say, use that term, and, and, and reduces the risk. Very to, much so. To the consumer and obviously to the organization. Yeah, and that's why when we work with people like our privacy officers, it's what are you trying to do in the analysis so that we can understand that data usage? Because that becomes important with what the data is that's carried through the analysis phase. You may not have to carry gender, you may not have to carry ethnic background, you may not have to carry any of these other markers that could put someone as, an, as you can identify someone with. So if we can keep those out, it's how you're using the data and the analysis at the end. And to follow up on that, you know, so that's the, what the privacy office does. It works with the business when they are envisioning a particular use of data, an application, a product that's going to do some of these analytics. We work with them to design that product to avoid some of these risks. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes the answer is we absolutely need that personal information because that's the purpose of that particular project. And in those cases, then we look at, did you have permission from the data subject to do what you want to do with the data? And if not, does the society good outweigh the risks? And can you mitigate those risks in certain ways? So that's the balancing act that we do and that's when we decide when it's past that creepy line or mm -hmm. when it hasn't. Because my role within the company is to advocate for the data subject to make sure that their expectations are being met uh, by Dell. I wonder if we can unpack another use case which is fraud detection, which mm -hmm. is advanced so rapidly in the last 10 years. It used to be six months and you'd find maybe something happened and you had to look at your own statements and now you're getting texts and very proactive, uh, uh, but certainly a lot of information has to be uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very narrow in terms of the individual. Can you talk about that use case? Yeah, the one thing that we find from our, our customers or the people we work with, when you talk about fraud, people don't mind that you're watching because you're reducing their liability. You're reducing someone from stealing that credit card from them um, or being able to run up charges. So when you talk about protecting someone, protecting someone's digital persona, their wallet, they're willing to give and take a little bit on what information they provide to you. They don't mind that you know that, hey, I'm in Austin, Texas today, and then someone's trying to charge in you know, Qatar to, uh, at the same day. They understand that. It, it's not a privacy issue, but I want to ask you about, the pendulum's kind of swung, like I said, it used to be, it would take forever to find out if there was some kind of fraud, and then it became like this flood of false positives. Uh, and, and, and and it seems to be getting better, and, and presumably it's because of big data analytics, but I wonder if you could talk about Absolutely. that. Absolutely, our fraud teams, as a matter of fact, at MasterCard, we work very hard to reduce the false positives, because that creates a bad experience for both the user as well as the issuer of that card, right? So what we try to do all the time is you can continue to do learning. 
machine learning, the artificial intelligence, how to reduce that. As you also look at people's patterns, is this person a, a professional traveler or a, always traveling? So that goes into the algorithm when we try to take a look at a false positive around fraud. Do they buy these types of goods with their credit cards? So again, when you start to look at the protection and you start to add those rules into it and you start to actually reduce it, it's, it's all about learning. It's not just one and done. Those algorithms have to be constantly updated in real time in some cases so that you're constantly in a learning phase. You're building models and iterating right, those much. models and that's always a challenge. I'd love to talk about that if we have time, but, but I wanted to ask you, Dale, talk about deep learning. My, Michael was talking a lot about machine learning and deep learning and part of his you know, visionary discussion uh, th this morning. What's the role of transparency? How do you guide your constituents in terms of transparency, what are the guidelines, how transparent, when to be transparent? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, transparency was where the privacy profession lived uh, 10 years ago. It was all about giving the consumers notice about why you're collecting the data and using it consistent with that notice and being very visible with privacy statements and you know, there's lots of laws around that now where you have to give specific notices. The problem with big data is, the power of it is using the data in ways that you didn't envision when you collected the data. And that is the dilemma for privacy and big data. And that's where the privacy community is trying to develop some tools for organizations to do a balancing act of, okay, the consumer didn't know that when they gave you that data it was going to be used for this purpose, but they're not, it's, go, it's tangential to that use. So, that would be an acceptable use. But if it's going to so surprise the consumer that you're using the data for, you really need to go back and get re-permissioned. Re and in some countries, it's an opt-in permission. I mean, it makes spam law, spam and do not call laws seem trivial, yeah. doesn't it? You were mentioning yeah. off camera that I think it's your CISO is, participates in public policy through the Obama administration. Is that, is that was it your CISO? Well, yeah, it's part of our DNA is security yeah. and securing the data. Our CEO has made a tremendous commitment to make sure that we can apply our best practices into and help the community understand how to make sure the data is secure, because that's a digital persona. We consider ourselves to be stewards of data, not owners of data. Someone has entrusted us with that, and we want to make sure that we're constantly contributing back on to make sure it's secure and used right um, as we take a look at that. How about regional nuances, local laws? How, uh, Describe sort of what you're seeing there, how you address those complexities. Yeah, so a good example is the new uh, European regulation that's going into effect May of 2018. That has a new specific requirement about profiling, automated decision making uh, that's uh, used for marketing purposes. You have to have an opt-in for using that data. Companies are going to struggle with how to implement that, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's a new law and that law has 4% of annual revenue as a potential penalty. Wow, so let me get this straight. You have to opt in to be automated profiled? Automated profiling where it's going to be used for certain types of purposes, decisions, and you know what they're really trying to avoid is the things that the Obama administration came out with a big data report as well, discrimination. Decisions that are made about insurance and credit, et cetera. Uh, that are automated decisions and then marketing decisions on those, uh, you know, with that data. Um, the uh, law now requires very specific opt-in and, and transparency. Boy, that's going to be tricky. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the thing for us is what was just described is working with people is the ability to tag that data as it's being brought in. So as you think of big data, that ingestion, that tagging of that data and carrying the metadata, what types of data needs to be tagged? what types of data you have to be watching out for. Was it an opt-in versus an opt-out? All that adds into understanding the power of what big data can do to protect both the individual and the company from being able to do something wrong with the information. So the nice part is with big data, you can do that. So again, we're working with our customers and with the privacy officers to understand how you do your data classifications, what data needs to be tagged, and then to be able to follow that full lineage through the entire ecosystem. And obviously that has to be done at the point of creation. Correct. Otherwise it's, it's not going to scale. 
uh, and, and technology helps you solve that problem? I mean, that's been a challenge for years, but it's, we're at yep. the day where that actually works now? Yeah, there's a lot of great partners, and we're here at you know, Dell World, um, Dell EMC World, and they're here as well, to help on that ingestion of data as it's coming in to start to tag it and to start to index and catalog it. If that's the power of what big data can help you with, because before you had to do it individually. Now you can actually use the tools. You can use AI to actually understand about that information coming in to do that tagging, to create that lineage. It's very, very important and very powerful, especially as we start looking at what's coming down the road. Dale, do you get involved in, in helping guide solutions? Is that yes, part so of your role? we have a process that is called the Privacy Impact Assessment Process, and it's in the life cycle development of our products and services. So much like the security reviews that are done when we, when we commercialize a product, we now are interjecting ourselves with a privacy review. So if that project or product development or application is intending to use big data analytics as part of it, we will, we will help guide the business whether they need to build in opt-in consents, what it is, that, what do they want to do with the product, and what kinds of things are, from a compliance perspective, do they need to build in, so that we are uh, at the table um, with our business partners. All right, we got to wrap, but Nick, I'll give you the last word. I mean, sort of as the, as the big data analytics, I'll call you a visionary, you know, what's the future hold? Where's your focus in the next, you know, near to midterm? You know, I want to stay right with the ethics world, and, and probably I always tell people, what we're asking now is just because you have the data, doesn't mean you have to use the data. Just because you have that information, you've got to become a parent and start to be able to put some parameters around how that data is used. So people in the privacy world, you need to bring them to the table. So again, just because you have it, doesn't mean you should be using it. And now it's better to be a parent than just to let people run crazy. Great, Nick and Dale, thanks very Thank much you. for coming to theCUBE. I love this conversation, it's fascinating. Thank Appreciate you. the work you, you do. All right, Thank keep you. it right there everybody. We'll be back. This is Dell EMC World from Austin, Texas. This is theCUBE, right back.